Hello everyone, welcome to Teacher Development Webinars. My name is Amanullah Sand and I facilitate virtual programs at Teacher Development Webinars. Teacher Development Webinars is a social action project to support teachers and educators around the world with professional development opportunities. It is an initiative using the rise in online professional development to connect people from around the world with opportunities which they may not have had due to the old normal of face-to-face -face conferences. And now for this webinar, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tammy Grigerson. Dr. Tammy Grigerson is a professor of TESOL at American University of Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates. She received her MA in education and PhD in linguistics in Chile, where she began her academic career. She is co-author with Professor Sara Mursa of Language Teacher Wellbeing, published by Oxford University Press. Together with Peter McIntyre, she wrote the books Capitalizing on Language Learner Individuality and Promoting Language Learners Nonverbal Communication in the Language Classroom. She is also co-editor with Peter and Sara Mursa of Positive Psychology in SLA and Innovations in Language teacher education. She has published extensively in a peer-reviewed journals and contributed to several chapters in applied linguistics anthologies on individual differences, teacher education, a language teaching methodology, and nonverbal communication in a language classroom. It's a player having you at teacher development webinars. Dr. Tammy, welcome to teacher development webinars. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. A huge pleasure to be here. And wow, this is amazing. Uh, I, you know what? I've always wanted to come to go to Pakistan. It's a, a, a place that in my mind is just fascinating with all kinds of deep, rich historical culture. And so for me, I am I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. So um, I'm going to be speaking today about teacher well-being, uh, particularly language teacher well-being. I mean, you know, being a language teacher is one thing, being a teacher is another thing, right? So I, I want to say that all over the world, wherever I've been, uh, and I meet um, TESOL people, TESOLers, right? TESOLers rock. Um, I've always felt a very deep kindredship because we're very special people, right? Because it means that we love language, um, we love teaching, but most of all, I think it's because, because we've chosen English, we've, we've chosen the language that unites us all. So I um, am just thrilled to be here and I am ready to start here. So let's see if I can share my screen. Okay, is that good? Are we, am, am I, am yep. I good? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So we're on the teacher development webinars for Pakistan and here we go. The topic of my, my talk today is striving toward thriving in teacher emotional well-being. There's all kinds of well-being, right? Uh, Sarah Mercer and I wrote a book on teacher well -being. Emotional well-being is only one of them. So um, we have we have you know workplace well being we have uh, the physical well being we have all kinds of different different things but I thought that the idea of talking about our emotional well being would be a, a a really good first step because I think that at the very core of everything we do is emotion and uh, whether you agree with me or not I think that we emote before we reason. So every time we make a decision, that decision has something, an emotional quality to it because it's coming from us, from inside of ourselves. And we are inherently emotional beings. So ah, let's get started. I'm excited. Here we go. Language teacher emotional well-being. And here's what I'm going to talk about today. Okay. There are six different ideas. Um, this is just very few of so many. The first thing I want to talk about is socio-emotional competence. Uh, the second one is uh, Fredrickson's, I, Barbara Fredrickson and her idea of the broaden and build theory of emotion. I want to talk about emotional self-regulation, which is similar to number one, but a little bit different, kind of nuanced. 
Uh, negativity bias, which is just you know one of these human things we just tend to do all the time. Emotional labor, something that people in service professions like teaching and nursing and medical that we all have, that we all suffer with. And then self-compassion, one of those things that we need to practice that probably we don't do enough. So that's just an outline of what I wanna do in the next 30, 45 minutes or so. And then I'll take some questions. So if you have any questions, you can do one of two things, either write them down and ask them at the end or put them in the chat box and then later we'll read them out. So either way, but I will be available for questions if you have anything or, or if you wanna share something, okay? And also, I want you to feel free to use the chat box to, to comment on things that I say. I don't have access to the chat box as I'm speaking, but one of the things that I, that I really love as a, as a teacher, as a professor, is that I've, I've realized since COVID that that chat box is a place where participants can really build rapport, that you can exchange ideas as I'm talking. I have no problem with that. And I would love that, okay? So if you have something that you wanna share with the group, please go ahead and use the chat box and let everybody know what you're thinking, okay? Here we go. Okay, Corn Okay, so we've got the cornerstone uh, being uh, self-awareness. The cornerstone of this kind of competence is self-awareness. If we really think about it, if, if we're not self-aware, then how can we be other aware, right? I mean, give that some thought. So it, evolved, it, it involves three stages, that whole idea of self-awareness. Number one, it's recognition. We have to recognize that we are experiencing an emotion, okay? We have to recognize we are experiencing an emotion. Sometimes we're just ripping through life and going, going, going. We have these physiological sensations that we're ignoring, right? And we don't recognize an emotion that we're actually feeling. Number two, after we are recognizing an emotion, we need to identify it. We need to name it. We need to label it. Why do we do that? Because we might recognize that we have some kind of emotion, but we might not recognize what that emotion actually is. So for example, let's take a look at the whole idea of anxiety, right? Learners have it, language learning anxiety, right? Teachers have it. Don't don't be, I mean, don't think that you're the only one. Every teacher who's ever taught a lesson has had some level or range of anxiety, right? So what happens is that we might feel or we might recognize that we're having um, an emotional reaction to something. So we might feel our palms sweating, or we might feel that we've got a dry mouth and we don't, we, we might think, oh, that's anxiety, right? But you could also have those same, those are the same physiological sensations we have when we're excited, right? So is this physiological, is this emotion that I'm feeling anxiety or is this excitement, right? So we need to identify and label what it is because remember, we're talking about our own social emotional competence. The last one, number three, is that when we are emotionally self-aware, we are aware of the effect and the function of the emotion that we're experiencing, okay? So I recognize that I've got these physiological sensations of emotion. I recognize that it might be anxiety. And then I need to be aware of its effect. What is the effect of anxiety on my experience in that moment. If I'm teaching, what does anxiety make me do? If I'm speaking to somebody in a foreign language, what is the effect and the function of that emotion? Okay. So this is what we're going to be calling socio-emotional competence, recognizing, identifying, and being aware of effect. Okay. Let's move on. There's this guy named Milky who says, don't feel bad about feeling bad. I kind of like that. Um, Demi Lovato has a song, right? Um, what, what is it? Um, 
and that's not don't feel bad about feeling bad. Demi Lovato has a song, help me out. Anyway, it's a pop song about, um, you know, not feeling bad about feeling bad. And so here's the thing. We talked in the last slide about identifying our emotion and knowing its cause or, or sorry, knowing its effect. So now let's take a look at what we can do when it's a negative emotion. We'll talk about positive emotion in a minute, but let's talk about a negative emotion. Number one, let's be aware of it. Okay. Number two, let's reflect on it. Let's say, okay, I'm, 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 I'm anxious. Okay. Why am I anxious? I, you know, okay. I, I give it some thought, but the curious thing is, is that usually we try to reject it, right? But the fact of the matter is, is that when we accept that we're feeling that emotion, we can deal with it. If you don't accept that feeling of emotion, it's hard to deal with, okay? So let's be aware, let's reflect, and let's accept it. Because I'm going to show you why negative emotion isn't necessarily a bad thing. Now, we're going to move on to the idea of well-being. And what is it? I really, really like the definition from Diner et al. And they say that well-being is life satisfaction, the presence of positive emotions, and a lack of negative emotion. Now, I want you to notice something here. I didn't say that it's the obliteration of negative emotion. What I said was that there's a preponderance or a greater amount of positive emotion than there is of negative emotion. <laughs> Barbara Fredrickson, who is the broad and build theory, and I'll talk about her in a minute, she got into trouble, a little bit of, of trouble with colleagues around the world when she tried to make a ratio of three to one. She said that for well-being to happen, you have to have three positive to one negative in order to experience well-being. I don't care about the numbers, everybody. Whether it's three to one, four to one, two to one, I, it really doesn't matter. What does matter is that we have to seek positivity and accept the negativity, okay? So now why am I going to say that? Because negative emotion has a role in our lives and a very important one. So now, what does Barbara Fredrickson say about the broad and build theory? She says that positive emotion broaden our awareness and encourage us to open up to new experiences and ways of thinking and doing. Negative emotion have a narrowing effect. This is what I want you to think about. I want you to think about the last time that you had to make a decision and you were in a really good headspace, right? You were in a good headspace. You were happy, you were positive, and you had some decisions to make. Can you think about the, the broadness, the, the, the array of decisions that were of, of options that were open to you? Because you were happy, you were in a good space, right? On the other hand, I want you to think about the last time you had to make a decision and you were in a negative headspace. You were feeling anxious or annoyed and you had to make a decision. Think about the options that you had available to you to work with. When we're in a bad headspace, suddenly all of those options com compress and it's kind of like, what am I going to do that I don't have any options? And that's the case. So what she said was she called it um, positive, she called it um, um, a, a, a positive, positive broadening, negative narrowing. We're positive and it broadens us, we're negative and it narrows us, okay? Now, we can actually alter the amount of positivity we experience by taking certain actions. So it's not like it just happens to us, like we have no control over the positivity or negativity in our lives. The fact is, we have a lot to do with the positivity and negativity that happens to us. And I'm going to bring you through some of those ideas. And these are just some kinds of, some people call them interventions. I like the idea that they're interventions, 
interventions, exercises, right? So now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of what can I actually do about it? Bringing it down from the academic ether, right? And bringing it down into the practicality of our regular normal lives. So what are some of the activities that lead to increased positivity? Here we go. Number one, Here's an activity for you, and it's one that I would love if you did it with your students, okay? This is one for you, but it's also one for your students. This is a great way to open up a class. It's a great way to take a break from academic work and talk to your students about well-being. It's a great way to end a class and end on a high note, right? But it's also a great way for you as a language teacher to just kind of enjoy life when life is kind of getting you down. Okay, so here we go. Be aware of the positive and allow your mind to replay positive experiences. Some people, you know what they call this? Savoring, to savor something, to kind of let yourself enjoy and relish and replay, right? That's why, you know, when we go on vacation, or we have some kind of a really fun evening with friends, it's not only in the moment that we're enjoying that. It's not just in the moment that that positivity is occurring. Because you know what? For a long time after that, we can bring our minds back to that and replay it and find that same kind of positivity. Okay, so now, I would like you to look at these prompts and I want you to, not, not right now. I mean, yeah, we're going to look at them now. But I want you in your free time, when you have some time, to answer them. Okay? And I want you to have them maybe in Post-it notes and post it all over so that when you open the refrigerator, you see a Post-it note, right? You open a locker to get out your gym clothes and you see another positivity note there. What I want you to do is answer these prompts and review them when your mind gets into that negative headspace. So question number one, my fondest memories are, okay? What are your fondest memories? You know, I, I have a new fond memory. Um, I just got a brand new puppy and his name is Shaka. And he's a rescue. And I don't know how I got to be so blessed with such an amazingly wonderful little dog. He's just the best. And so I've, I've come to these moments when I start, you know, maybe I, I might start getting, you know, like, why did that kid say that? And I'll think, oh, Shaka. <laughs> Number two, the quotes that inspire me most are, you know what? I know a lot of people who take these notes and put them all over of quotes that inspire them. I'll tell you one of my favorite quotes and I probably don't need to keep uh, encouraging myself to be so crazy, but I love this quote that says, well-behaved women never make history. I'll say that again. Well-behaved women never make history. So you know what that says? It says, you know what? Do what you need to do when you know that it's right. And I have that actually posted in my office. So when I start thinking, well, I better not do that because you know what, I might get in trouble. Um, I'm, I'm here to make history. There's only one life to live, right? Number three, some lines from my favorite poem or songs are, I have one that I absolutely love. I don't know if you guys listen to him. His name, my favorite, favorite singer in the whole world is Andrea Bocelli. He is, um, if I weren't married, I'd marry him. That's how much I like Andrea Bocelli. He has a song called Dare to Live. And I have the lyrics posted in my, uh, on, on the wall in my room because it says, um, it, it, it talks about dare to live because there's not just one truth. And I just love to be reminded about that. Dare to live. My favorite film or TV show is, 
Now, in this case, if you just have the title written somewhere, and then that draws you, when you see the title, you're reminded of what it was that you loved about that movie, right? So for example, um, my favorite, one of my favorite films is a film, because I'm an English teacher, right? Is the one with Robin Williams, um, Dead Poet Society. And again, the Dead Poet Society, it, when I think about the Dead Poet Society, I think about the, 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 the phrase that they kept saying throughout the, that movie. Um, what was it? Um, ah, help me out. There was a, a phrase in the movie about, about daring to live, right? Um, and it was just a, it's a beautiful movie. And I, if I just had that, a, a picture of Robin Williams on my wall, I would remember that. The most beautiful thing in my home or garden is maybe take a picture of it, maybe post a photo of it so that when you see it, it's like, ah, oh, my refuge. My husband planted uh, uh, some bougainvilleas here in, in Sharjah in our backyard. And it's just such a beautiful, peaceful place. It's too hot to sit out there in the daytime. But when the sun's going down and it's cool in the evening, those bougainvilleas are so beautiful and I just love to sit out there, right? And so a picture of that is a nice thing to think about. Now, as teachers, can you imagine the best teaching experience I ever had is, right? Because those are the most, you know, when you start feeling like, oh, you know what? That lesson that I just gave really wasn't very good or what a, what a, that lesson just bombed. But if I walk back to my office and I remind myself of one of the best experiences I've ever had, that one that I just gave tends to, tends to kind of fade in comparison, right? So anyway, um, I won't talk more about this, but just think about these things, about being able to savor these things. So go to a quiet place when you've got some time, fill in these prompts, post them all over. And so when you see them, you remember, ah, life isn't that bad, okay? Keep a positivity portfolio. This is Fredrickson. Now, what is a positivity portfolio? It's, um, it's collecting all of those things that give you joy. So for example, um, maybe a student wrote you a thank you note. Um, maybe you teach K-12 and a parent um, uh, sent you a, a small token, a, a gift. Um, maybe your administrator gave you a teacher of the month award. But keep those, you know, it could be electronic, right? It could be a box. But it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a place where you keep those things where when you're feeling down and out and boy, I, I'm just not on my game, you can pick up that portfolio, maybe open that box, rifle through some of that stuff, and you see it and you say, yeah, yeah, you know what, this is good. I, I, I'm not, it's not all bad, right? That's a positivity portfolio. Now, I'm moving on to our, our third idea, which is emotional self-regulation, which is very similar to what I was talking about in terms of socio-emotional competence. And now I'm going to give you some ideas about how you can develop this. Now, some people are going to say that avoidance is not a very good coping strategy. But I would suggest that at times, and probably a lot of times, avoiding avoidance is a good emotional self-regulation strategy. If you know that there's a certain situation that's going to, that's going to generate negativity, avoid it. Why, why, why do that to yourself? You know, um, I was talking to my daughter over the summer about, about that avoidance of situations. And when we know that a situation is going to be annoying or irksome or even make us sad, I avoid those situations. For example, you know what, um, you might think that I'm a coward, but one of the things I try hard never to do is to say goodbye. I don't like going to the airport to drop people off. Uh, no, I'll drop them off, but I don't say goodbye, 
right? I don't, when I, when I leave for, for, when I leave to come back to Sharjah and my kids are all at my house, my, they're adult kids, um, I don't say goodbye. I just walk out of the house. Yep, see you later, <laughs> right? I avoid what's going to bring me into a, the depths of despair, right? Number two, modify the situation. Modify the situation. So for example, um, I, I have colleagues with whom I work very, very well, and I love them dearly. We're very like-minded. But I also have two or three colleagues who, I, I'm so sorry, but they annoy me. They not only annoy me, they frustrate me, and they make me mad because I think they're dumb. So I don't like to be, I, I don't like to have to deal with them. So how do I modify my situation? I choose the committees on which I wanna work, right? So I modify my situation. I find the people who are most like-minded, who I work well with, and I modify that situation. Number three, a very important one, choose where to focus your attention, okay? So now, here's the thing. Remember that dog I told you that I have, this new puppy? My husband did not want that dog. He didn't want a dog, he didn't want a dog, he didn't want a dog, and for 15 years, I didn't have a puppy. And I sacrificed for 15 years because I really wanted one. So we get the puppy. And this puppy is so loving. He jumps into your lap and he licks your face and you come home and he's so happy to see us. Right? But like a puppy, he poops and pees on the floor in the house because I'm trying to potty train him. And so my husband gets mad and he says, get rid of that dog. He's pooping all over the house. And then my response is, oh yeah, but Poppy, when you sit on the couch, he comes over there and licks your face. Pay attention to that. Forget the poop, I'll clean it up. <laughs> well, change your way of thinking. Modify the way you think. For example, um, one of the, okay, I was talking to you about one of these colleagues who I don't like to work with. Um, I think we all have them. And so I, I, over the summer, I decided that this one colleague that I have, I was going to change the way that I thought about her. And instead of being annoyed and actually angry at the way she is mean to people, I decided that I was going to stop being angry and rather start feeling sorry for her. Because I can't imagine having no friends. She is so mean to everybody, she has no friends. And so I thought to myself, rather than being angry that she's so mean, I should feel sorry for her because how lonely it must be for her to live the life that she's got because she's lonely. So I started changing my way of thinking about her. And actually I got back to campus a week, uh, three or four days ago and I saw her and that way that I changed my thinking completely changed the way that I approached her. Instead of avoiding her, I went up and I gave her a hug because I thought you must be so lonely. And you know what? Not only was that good for her, but it was so good for my soul. It was so good for my soul because I tried to be the better person and changed my way of thinking. The last one is to decide on your post-emotion response. You have a decision to make. You felt an emotion. You had an emotion. You experienced an emotion. Now you have a decision to make. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to wallow in it and keep it like an earworm in your head going through your head for the next three days? Or are you going to decide as a post-emotion response to take action that's positive? You decide what to do after that experience of an emotion. You have more control than you think you do. I said the word control. It's the same as self-regulation. Self-regulation is a form of control. 
Okay, you have the decision to make. Next slide. Negativity bias. Oh gosh, you know what everybody, everybody has this. It's a, it's a natural human response. And it's this tendency to focus on the adverse. Now you might think, no, wait, I'm gonna say, some people have a greater tendency towards it than others, right? I mean, it's, it's all a range, right? It's not like we all have always negativity bias or none of us never have negativity bias. The idea is, is that all of us at some point in our lives experience this. So let me give you an example. How many of us at the end of every semester have student evaluations? I do. And I've had 30 years of teaching experience and so I've had at least 60 times where I've read through student feedback, okay? Now, you'd think that after 60 times I would learn, right? No, here's the thing. You get them back, right? So, and you, you get them and you read them. And in my case, I get like 20 of them. And I read through them and I have 25, 24, of them are amazing. My students loved me. They were just so happy to, to be in class and they learned so much and yeah. And then one student of those 25, one will say that my class was mediocre. Okay, that's perfectly legitimate. Somebody can think that my class was mediocre. That's not a problem. But what happens to me is that instead of thinking about those 24 learners, who really enjoyed my class and really learned a lot, my mind spends the next month lamenting over this one student who said I was mediocre and thinking, what can I do to not be mediocre anymore? Right? Negativity bias, guys. Now, here's the trick. Here's the, the intervention. Here's one of those activities that I'd like you to do. Um, sometime when you have some time. When, okay, at the moment of feeling that negativity bias, okay, first you have to recognize that it's a negativity bias. That's the first thing. When you recognize that you are having a bias towards negativity, I want you to challenge that belief. I want you to challenge the belief that you are negative and I want you to prove it to yourself. So, when responding irrationally to an adverse circumstance, I want you to think about these questions, okay? And when you answer these questions, you're gonna realize that what you are really feeling is irrational. The fact that I'm concentrating on being one person saying I'm mediocre and 24 saying I'm exceptional, that's irrational, everybody, right? That's irrational. So. What unrational belief do I want to conquer? Well, that I'm mediocre. Two, can I reasonably defend this belief? Well, one person said I was mediocre and they gave me the reasons, but there are also 24 people. So really, no, that there's really not a strong defense. What proof exists for the veracity of this belief? What proof exists that this belief is flawed? Well. 24 other people. What would be the worst outcome if this belief became reality? Well, I'm not gonna lose my job over one mediocre uh, explanation, right? So what would be the worst outcome? Probably nothing. What positive actions could I take if this belief became reality? Well, probably try harder to not be mediocre, but I mean, I've got 24 other people, right? What would be a more rational way of viewing this belief? You know what would be the most rational way? Hey, you know what? 24 people said I'm doing a pretty good job. One person said I wasn't. Why don't I take a look at what that one person said and see if I can make some adaptations? But I'm still pretty good. Do you see what I'm saying, everybody? There's got to be a way for us to take a look at when these, this negativity comes at us that we rationally take a look at this feeling that that's kind of taking control, okay? And in order to do that, 
Take a look at these questions. See how it works, okay? Next slide. Emotional labor, okay. Emotional labor is something that, what I mentioned at the beginning, service-oriented professions feel quite often because we are there in service to others. Because we serve other people, we feel this need to suppress emotions that are not perceived as professional or as um, helpful. So emotional labor, the definition, Hothschild, 1983, suppressing a certain emotion and performing another in line with role expectations. So for example, I'm a teacher. I'm not, it, it is not professional, nor is it helpful for me to express annoyance or anger with a student. It's not, it's not a good thing. I should be the better person. I should be a bigger person. So what happens when I'm annoyed or I'm mad, I suppress that feeling and rather I perform, I put on a different face, right? And that's not bad. That's not bad. It's expected. Now let's see what happens. When does emotional labor become harmful? Emotional labor is a natural part of being a teacher, a nurse, a doctor. In the caring professions, we do that because we don't want the other person, the, other, the people we're serving, we don't want them to feel badly, right? That emotional labor becomes harmful when it damages our health, and adversely influences our well being over time. I'll tell you something research suggests that harmful emotional labor is one of the main reasons for teacher burnout and the reason that we leave the profession. So, you know what, everybody, we had better take care of that emotional labor when it's harmful, or we're going to end up getting so frustrated that we want to leave the profession. So, what can we do about it? It's very similar to the self-regulation that I talked about before. When you feel that, that stressful emotional labor, sometimes it might not bother you. But when that emotional labor does become stressful and it does become a bother, you need to distinguish it and label it. Okay, I'm feeling stressed because I'm angry and I can't express it. Okay. Number two observe it, but then liberate it, right? I'm feeling angry and frustrated. This is what I'm feeling right now. I'm going to let it go. I've got to let this go. I've got to let go the frustration of having to suppress what I really feel. Number three is very important. And for me, probably the most important step of the four. I might have people who disagree with that, but for me, in my personal experience, number three is very important. Number three is forecast and recognize. For me, I know when I am going to feel the stress of emotional labor because it happens at similar times under similar circumstances. I can forecast when I'm going to feel that, right? For example, um, I can forecast my suppression of annoyance when students start complaining about a test or a certain assessment. Right? I want to just say, hey, shut up. It was a fair test. I prepared you for this. You didn't study. That's what I want to do. Right? But what do I have to do? Oh, come on, guys. I prepared you for the test. You had the study guide. You had time to work. You knew it was coming up. I had you in study groups. Come on. Who, you know, don't put this on me. Don't put this on me, right? So I can forecast that and I can recognize this, right? So what is step number four? To identify the patterns. To identify the patterns of 
I'm forecasting this. I know it's going to happen. I recognize this. The pattern is I'm going to feel this. I've got to let it go and it's going to happen again. Okay. So you identify the patterns of how this emotional labor is playing out. And you know what, everybody, I'll tell you something. There isn't a recipe for this. It looks like I'm giving you recipes, but it's only going to be you who is going to be able to forecast, recognize, and identify the patterns. Nobody else but you, right? So um, I'm, I, I can't give you a recipe for how to forecast or how to recognize, but if you can, give it a shot, okay? Now, the last thing we're going to talk about is self-compassion. Um, and this self-compassion might be a way actually of, of dealing with emotional labor as well. Um, Catherine Neff, I think the name is Catherine, but she, uh, Neff, uh, Catherine, is like the guru of everything that is self-compassion. And she says this, she says, we need to treat ourselves with the same kindness, caring, and compassion that we would show a good friend or even a stranger, right? So say for example, um, you just had a class that bombed, right? Well, how about this? The, 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 you, you lost control of the class. Classroom management, always a big problem, right? The kids just weren't with you that day. They were talking among themselves. They didn't get their work done. And you walked out of there feeling really low. Right. You walked out of there thinking you were a failure. I, you know, how come I couldn't get that class under control? So how about this? If you had talked to your best friend about that, your best friend would have said, oh, no, don't. You know what? It's not you. I mean, those 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 students, they had decisions and it was their choice to behave like that. You know what? It wasn't your fault. You have to make sure that blame is given where it is. So you know what? Your best friend would say that to you. So now what is self-compassion? Say to yourself what your best friend would have said to you. That's self-compassion. So now here's the activity. When you feel like you need some compassion, write down whatever it was that caused you the negative emotion or would you judged yourself for, right? Consider how you would respond to that experience if you were your most generous, kindest friend, okay? And then, because you wrote that down at the beginning, now respond to that prompt by writing a response to yourself that shows yourself that same kind of compassion. Okay, now, when you perform acts of kindness, it's called altruism. I don't know about you, but when, but, but when, I'm, when I do something nice for somebody else, there's a really good kickback. I not only did something nice for somebody, but that helping somebody made me feel good. You know what it's called? There's actually a, a name for it. It's called helper's high. Helpers high. When you, when you do kindness for somebody else, there's altruism. Now, I'll, I'll stop with this, with this example. Um, <laughs> you know, I live, in, I live in, in Sharjah, and I came to, this is my fifth year. And one of the, I, I've always wanted to have an, I've always, I, I love traveling, and I love adventure, and I love intercultural experiences. I, I live for this. But there was a breaking point in my personal life four years ago that was kind of like the icing on the cake that said to me, you need to leave, you need to leave the US and, and, and do something different for a little bit. And it was, um, and I don't know your politics, I'm just gonna tell you what happened here. Um, president Donald Trump was elected president and he had made some early comments in his presidency that just destroyed my identity as an American. And it was the whole Muslim commentary that he had, you know, 
started and it, it was so ugly. And I felt so, so negatively moved by this. I, I had to do something about it for my own sake. And so first of all, the one thing I decided was I was not going to watch the news for an entire month. I wasn't going to watch the news. I didn't want to see or hear anything about this. And then what I did was I decided that for the next month, while I wasn't watching the news, I was going to approach every single Muslim person who I knew was Muslim, and mostly it was women because I, they were hijabi. I would go up to every single Muslim person I found and thank them for coming to the United States to make the, my culture more diverse, for, for being willing to leave their culture to make my culture better. And you know what? That made me feel, it, it took away all the pain. It took away all the pain of what was going on with all that whole political mess. And it was something that really in, in, in my own life did something good for me. And I'll tell you something, the, the, my Muslim women friends, um, some of them actually hugged, they didn't know me, but they would hug me and thank me. And some of them, two of them actually cried thanking me because they said that it's a tough time to live in America. And so, you know what? Altruism has a place and it has a place for the person you're being kind to, but also for the kickback it gives to you. Because I, I, I really did feel much better by doing that. So anyway, um, I wanted to thank you for coming. And I wanted to thank you for everything that you did during the pandemic. I'm hoping that, that, that now we're all going to be face to face and um, seeing our students live. But you know what? Be proud of yourselves for everything you did during that pandemic because you were the frontline workers. I'm proud of you. And I've never been prouder to be a teacher. And I'm proud to be one of you. So that's it, guys. I, I'm, I'll take some questions. Thank you so, so much. You're welcome. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Tammy. And yes, uh, it was a, for uh, your inspirational talk. It was wonderful to have you. And, uh, uh, you know, I was, uh, uh, as we, you know, uh, were listening to your wonderful talk, I was going through this, all these ideas. And one of the theme uh, questions which appeared in our chat and YouTube was your experiences, how you dealt with a COVID situation and the pandemic. So, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. During the pandemic, it was really tough because, you know what, I think by nature, we're social creatures. Right. And I mean, just living, I mean, not having that that social interaction. You know, we had we had social media, but there's nothing like face to face interaction and that and that kind of joy. And so um, I was I was doing a lot of these well-being seminars during the pandemic. And we talked a lot about what kind of strategies can we use just to get through this. So, yeah. We have uh, some comments from okay. uh, Fernando. Yes, Fernando says, when you detach yourself from uh, material things, think less about money, worry more about others and doing something even if it is just a grain of sand to try to make a difference in someone's life, it will make an enormous difference in your well-being. Caring and sharing is one of the has of well-being. Right. Um, I'm sorry, who, was, who said that? Yes, uh, uh, Fernando from Brazil. Fernando? You know yeah. what? I thank you so much for saying that because you know what? There is actually a, this is crazy. He I mean, I'll, you know, he should be a philosopher because there's some research on that. When um when the, um it's suggested that when you have a little bit of extra money, I mean we don't always because we're teachers, right? So <laughs> so money doesn't come all the time, but um researchers suggest that if you've got a little bit of extra money, don't spend it on things, but spend it on experiences. Invite somebody out for dinner, uh, you know, go on, uh, you know, go on a vacation, do something like that. Because why? Because the well-being kickback from experiencing happiness is it lasts much longer than the well-being kickback from buying yourself a new pair of shoes. 
So say, for example, I buy myself a new pair of shoes with the extra $40 that I have. I put the shoes on and they're only new for one time. I put them on and they're new once and I love them the first time I wear them, but then it's kind of like, ah, I wore those already, right? So the happiness, the well-being that you got from buying a new pair of shoes, very small. But if I invite a friend out for dinner and we enjoy a lovely conversation and we, uh, you know, we, we explore each other's lives and we make each other laugh and we cry together, that experience, that well-being experience lasts for days, weeks. And if we savor it um, purposefully, it could last a lifetime. Agree. So, yes, we have come in positive emotion, well being, helps us see more options and perspectives of solve issues. Negative emotions instead, uh, instead hinder that attitude. You know what? Um, the thing about negative emotion, and I didn't, I didn't get into this very much. I was mm -hmm. talking about positive emotion, but negative emotion has a very important role in our lives for, for at least two reasons. First of all, negative emotion, if you, didn't, if you didn't experience sadness, you wouldn't know what happiness is, right? So you, I mean, in order to know that what you're feeling is a good feeling, you have to know what a bad feeling feels like, right? The other reason that, that um, negative emotion uh, works for us is evolutionary in, in the sense that it spurs us to action. So for example, if you were a person who lived way back when, when we lived with wild animals and you saw a bear and you felt fear, fear is a negative emotion. You felt fear, fear is a good thing because it makes you run, right? So fear is a good thing. You know what, say for example, if you're in a, in a relationship and you feel jealousy, well, jealousy is kind of a negative emotion, right? Jealousy is not that jealousy doesn't feel good. But feeling jealous might make you reflect upon how committed are you to this relationship and do I need to be doing more? Right? So so negative negative emotion spurs us to do things differently. And so um a, a negative emotion is not a bad thing. So when I say you know, don't eradicate it completely. There are reasons. Oh, yes, that's great. Uh, another question is about teacher bias. Teacher, uh, and what about the negative teacher bias? Can, how can we deal with this? Um, in, in terms of, of the social implications of, of, of teachers, uh, I'm not exactly sure how to, to, to um, interpret the question. Do you want to interpret yes. that? Yes. So, uh, uh, you know, in my context, uh, I think it is about, uh, uh, you know, one teacher not being fair with some of the students, oh. are, uh, you know, kind of uh, liking someone over someone. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, you know what? Let's, I'll, I'll take that question as something like um, the, the, the negativity biases between colleagues maybe, um, and how to deal with that. Um, well, I, I talked to you a little bit about what I did with that one colleague, but um, I, I actually said a few things. Number one is avoidance. <laughs> if, I, if, if, you know, if, if you can avoid somebody who gives you the, a, a negative vibe, avoid them. I mean, why, why deal with it? Another thing is, if you have to work with them, um, do what you can to be the better person. Um, it, you know, um, take take pride in the fact that you can that that you can be better, you, you, that you can behave in a way that's um, more judicious, um, more loving. You know, it's easy it's easy to love people who love you back. It's very difficult to love people who don't love you. So when you can love someone who doesn't love you back, that is really love, right? That is really caring. And so if we're gonna, if there's negative relationships, 
and you can and, and you can do your best to keep moving forward in in full blown positivity and care. Um, it, it ceases to be your problem. It ceases to be your problem because if you're nice to people who aren't nice to you, you can walk away knowing you were the you did the right thing. If you get dragged into all the yuckiness. And you get, you know, and you go blow for blow, you walk away feeling horrible, right? Because you just had a, a, you know, a knockdown, drag out argument with an idiot, right? So be the better person. Awesome. So next question is, teachers are emotionally affected by well-being of uh, students too. How can teachers deal with this uh, to develop their personal well-being? Um, are they affected by the well-being of their students, are you saying? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, that is so true. Um, I just uh, published a paper with a colleague. Oh, thank you. I just published a, 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 the questions for up. I just published a paper with a colleague from Saudi Arabia. And we were taking a look at how does... Uh, what happens with the emotional contagion in the classroom? So what we did was we wanted to find out if a teacher walked into the classroom feeling motivated and happy, and what happens to the students? If the teacher walks into the classroom grumpy and frustrated, how do the students respond? So what we did was uh, at the beginning of, of each class, we had seven teachers over the space of one month um, on a scale of one to 10, mark how motivated am I to be here right now, right? And then at the end of the class, they did the same thing to see if there was any difference between the beginning of the class and the end of the class. And then we did the same with the learners to see if there was a tendency of, if the teacher's motivation went up, did the student motivation go up? If the teacher's motivation went down, did the student's motivation go down? And it was crazy how the emotional contagion was always present. How teachers feel and how learners feel connects. So when you as a teacher care about your own well-being. You're also affecting the well being of your learners. So, when you are in a good headspace, there's a more, as a greater probability of your learners being in a good headspace than if you weren't. That is important. That is powerful. So, you have a reason besides yourself to take care of yourself, to be, to be concerned about your own well being. Mm -hmm. Awesome. An interesting question about, you know, what if one of your students is emotionally attached in, you know, some teacher, how would you deal with this like situation? If the student is like in, an, in, a, in a bad headspace? Yes. Yes. As, yes, our, uh, uh, yes. You know, he's emotionally involved in teachers. And, and, and how to deal with it? Yes. How you can say romantically? Okay, um, very, very interesting question because there's a, you know, there's this, there's an issue of individual student negativity and then there's the issue of class, whole negativity, right? Because when you've got a whole class that needs some work, I mean, you, we can start creating interventions um, in, in our, um, I've got a, I, I'm working with Sarah Mercer on some ideas to increase learner well-being. A lot of people are writing about it right now. And so um, I would suggest that, because um, we're running out of time, but I would suggest that, um, that, that you guys take a look at some of the new stuff coming out online and, and, in, and in books about what we can do to improve learner well-being in the classroom. There's so many cool things we can do. And I just want to say one thing that's really important. Because we're language teachers, one of the things that happens is that if we're using language, it doesn't matter what the content of the language is, right? If we can get learners talking, it doesn't matter if we're talking about why volcanoes erupt or if we're talking about what we can do to make ourselves feel less frustrated about having so much homework, 
Do you see what I'm saying? We need to get students involved and talking and writing and producing language. If we can get them involved and in producing language about their own emotional health and well being, it's a good thing, right? It's a good thing. So get learners talking about it. Thank you so, so much, uh, Dr. Tammy Gregerson, for this wonderful talk. I really appreciate your time and expertise. So in the last, any final message, our words for our audience? Yeah, you know what? Um, dare to live. Yeah, go, you know what? This is, go find Andrea Bocelli on YouTube. Find Andrea Bocelli on YouTube. Find his song, Dare to Live. Put on headphones so that you're not interrupted and listen carefully to his words and his gorgeous tenor voice. And you know what? Dare to live. Wonderful. I think that's a beautiful note to end. Thanks very much again uh, for this wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it a lot. And uh, thanks to all uh, wonderful participants on YouTube and on Zoom for joining us. And if you want certificate for this talk, you can email us at info.tdwebinars at the rate of gmail.com. For our future webinars, you can register at www.tdwebinars.org. We are available on all our social media channels and we share our webinars of that on our, all our social media channels. If you have got talk takeaways from this webinar, you can take us at tdwebinars on Twitter using hashtag tdwebinars available on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and this talk will be available on teacher development webinars, YouTube channel. So yeah, thanks very much again. Appreciate your presence here. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so